well, Labor Day weekend, the break, holiday. Uh, I think it's fascinating uh, in America that we are so appreciative of the efforts of the American worker and of the accomplishments of the workforce um, developing and building our country that they actually created a federal holiday to honor uh, honor uh, the American worker. And uh, I think that's very appropriate. I think it's wonderful. Um, of course, it's great for kids because they get the day off and it's good for uh, federal workers. I didn't get a lot of Labor Days off working in my regular job. Um, sometimes you'd get a little bonus pay or something like that. But it wasn't one of those major holidays, but yet it's still one that is worthy of, of recognition and comes every year and we appreciate it. And I am going to kind of uh, use that as a springboard for my message today. Um, I know we just had a, a wonderful family prayer together. I just want to bow my head one more time uh, as we transition now to the message. God in heaven, uh, Lord, we come before you today with thankfulness and with expectation, Father. I just pray that your voice would be heard here, that your message would be uplifted, that your son would be blessed, and that uh, this would be an opportunity to hear uh, from your throne room, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, some of what I'm sharing today is kind of a, a tag along with a message I shared earlier in the year. And uh, you may recall some echoes and things from that if you were part of the, uh, the service back then. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Um, there are lots of just different historical ways of kind of analyzing great feats of, uh, of engineering and things like that. There's the seven ancient wonders of the world, the seven modern wonders of the world. There is uh, different ways that people have tried to say that there are also wonders of American development and building and engineering. And so for my kids quiz this morning, I want to see if the, the kids can identify um, what, according to the travelchannel.com, is the seven wonders of American uh, uh, architecture and engineering and structure. So we're going to go through them one by one. If you think you know what the picture is, just raise your hand. I'd, I'd love to have your participation here. If you think uh, th this is a, a, a hint, I'll give you the pictures one by one. Okay, this is the first one. If, you're, if you think you know what this is, uh, I actually saw Caleb's hand first. Sorry, guys. I, I try to be fair, but I like Caleb better than you, too. So that's why I'm going, just kidding. Just kidding. Owen and Jacob, you know I love you. Caleb, what are we looking at here? This is Mount Rushmore. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Not too many other places in the world you can think of that has uh, this very eccentric, odd uh, sculpture out of the, the, the mountains. Um, you know, they've worked on the Crazy Horse uh, uh, development for years. I think that one is basically stalled. If they ever finish the Crazy Horse monument, it will dwarf the size of Mount Rushmore, but I think that is stalled. So for the time being, Mount Rushmore. And, you know, originally, you can see George Washington, they start to develop uh, some of his torso. Originally, the entire mountain was to be not just their head, but their entire torso and the front of their, their bodies. But, uh, you know, as, as things happen, this was as far as they've gotten. And so that's an amazing thing and, and a, certainly a, a wonder of American ingenuity. Now, what are we looking at? All right, Owen. The Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, it's an amazing feat of engineering. Uh, the way in which it was built had the most stringent safety measures ever at that time when it was built in the 1930s, something like that. I, I don't have all the history memorized on these things, but it is a symbol. A lot of these things, there's bigger bridges and, and, and you know more complicated bridges. A lot of these things are just symbolic uh, of, of, of the accomplishment of the time. Um, and so the Golden Gate Bridge is certainly one of those uh, symbolic things of American uh engineering and development. All right, what are we looking at here? All right, Jacob. That's the Washington Monument. That's right. And again, this is Travel Channel. You might have your own list. You might like things better. But the Washington Monument is one that the Travel Channel included. And I don't know, can you see that the color changes? Do you see this transition? It's a lighter gray down here and then a kind of a tan up here. Um, that's because it took them 40 years to build this. And in the middle of that, there was something called the Civil War. And so there was a lot of delays and things like that. So by the time they finished it, the quarries that they used to get the marble were different quarries. And over time, uh, sunlight and erosion and everything changed the color of the marble. And so um, it's a, a, a tribute to our first president called the Washington Monument, 555 feet high. Um, again, there's uh, bigger monuments and bigger, bigger obelisks in the world probably. But uh, for America, it's very symbolic of, uh, of our first president. 
All right, do we know this one? I, I see Caleb's hand. I, I want to give others a chance. I know I know you're, you're... Okay, is it Emmett? All right, Emmett, what are we looking at? The Empire State Building. That's right. Uh, again, it's not the tallest building. It's not the most complicated building, but it was built during the Depression. Uh, there was kind of a competition between GM and Chrysler at the time to see who could build a bigger building, and the, the Empire State Building is a result of that. And kind of just a tribute, again, to the American worker that at that critical time of depression and lack of opportunity and things, uh, that they were still able to invest and build this uh, very symbolic building in New York. And I don't even think it ranks probably in the top 20 of tallest buildings anymore. Um, they've far exceeded. I don't remember the height of, of the Empire State Building. All right, what about this one? Yeah? The Space Needle. And what city is this? You know? Oh, uh, Seattle, that's right. This is from my home state. Okay, so for the uh, the World's Fair in the 1960s, I think it was, uh, they uh, built this in preparation for that uh, uh, World's Fair. They put the Space Needle up. It was supposed to represent futurism and, and the idea of kind of flying off into space, I guess, and and it's become a landmark for the Pacific Northwest. And again, TravelChannel.com, it wasn't my choice. Uh, it's just one that they put together uh, representing, again, the, the uh, accomplishments of American engineering and the American worker. Okay. All right, now this one is, uh, this. I put this one kind of last because it's not as definite. It is the bridge that we're looking at here. It is the bridge. Does anyone know what bridge this is? It's a symbol also of American engineering. Yes, Toby. It is the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah, the Brooklyn Bridge was uh, one of the earliest bridges that connected uh, uh, two of the uh, the br uh, bureaus, boroughs, what do you call them? Um, is anyone from New York? I, I don't want to insult anybody here by saying it wrong. But again, it was hugely symbolic of, of the development of America not the greatest bridge, it's not the beautiful, most beautiful, but it is, again, a very uh, historically important bridge. And I guess there's still a debate whether it's a myth or fact that when uh, immigrants came, people tried to sell them the deed to the Brooklyn Bridge. Have you heard that story? For years I was told that's a myth, but there's other research saying that that actually happened, um, that people would come and they'd be, oh, I've got the deed to the, I, I don't need it anymore for a hundred bucks, I'll let you have the ownership of the bridge. And, uh, uh, I guess that's not very nice of Americans to do that to, to immigrants, but uh, there's all kinds out there, aren't there? Okay, the last one. Now, this is from the perspective of the wonder looking out. Okay, so it's not the little sky bridge here. It's You can just kind of see the bowl of it and the river below. Um, this is on the Colorado River, and I'm going to give Leah a chance. Leah? The Hoover Dam. That's right. Uh, the Hoover Dam. They, they essentially had to build an entire city to accomplish the building. I, I'm kind of a nerd about these things. I like to watch the documentaries and the history. I'm just fascinated by all this. They had to basically build a city and had people living there, constantly moving the concrete, and it was a, an amazing thing. People said it couldn't be done, and the Hoover Dam was built, and uh, I think it still might be the tallest dam in the United States. I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I didn't look up all the details on these things. It's, it's more just to to reference them. So um, as I was going through this, I thought, what if we were to think about what are the seven great uh, construction wonders of the Bible? What are the great uh, construction wonders of the Bible? Now, I'm not going to do this as far as the quiz. I'm just going to put them up here for your analysis and for, for, for fun here. But if you were to think about it, now, I, I'm trying to think of things, and by the way, this is my list. You might have a different list. Your list might be better, and that's fine. Uh, you can be wrong. I have no problem with that. But if... Um, uh, I'm trying to think of things that are specifically emphasized in the Bible. So we know that the pyramids were there in the Bible days, but they're not really mentioned, right? So I didn't include the pyramids. We know that the hanging gardens were in Babylon, but they're not really mentioned, so I didn't include that. I'm trying to think of things that play a role in the Bible. So um, this, the first one I thought would probably uh, 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 be worthy of mention is the Tower of Babel, right? The, this great ziggurat of a temple built back there in the book of Genesis it was such an amazing edifice that God himself felt he had to interact and, and, uh, 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 and actually prevent that from, from becoming a structure. What happened to it, we don't know. Fall probably was, fell into decay and was dis, uh, disassembled and earthquakes and whatnot. But I'm sure at the time, that was one of the great, greatest construction things that had ever taken place. Um, but even before, oh, and then the other one I wanted to mention, uh, the golden image. 
The golden image uh, there in Daniel chapter 3, um, it would have been about 90 feet high um, if you go by the cubit uh, measurement that, that we believe is accurate um, and about nine feet wide. It's, the Bible says it was of solid gold. Um, that's a hard one to interpret because to, to generate that much gold uh, for that size of a statue is, is almost unfathomable. Um, but it, it clearly would have been one of the ancient wonders of the world like the Colossus of Rhodes and the Lighthouse of Alexandria and things like that. So I thought that one was worthy of mention. So those are kind of on the negative side. Um, you know, both of these were kind of signs of rebellion and idolatry and things like that. Um, what about this? What are we looking at? This is Noah's Ark. And this is an actual picture of the Noah's Ark encounter in, in Kentucky. Um, is it in Lexington where it is? This is the actual building where you can go and do a walkthrough. Have any of you ever done that before? Have any of you ever been to Kentucky and done that? You guys have? Uh, I haven't done it, but uh, we might do it this next year. I've heard it's pretty amazing. Uh, it's it's a t an attempt to build to, a, to the scale that we understand, and, and it's a museum that you walk through and it highlights the flood and things like that. So uh, I think that would have qualified as one of the great structures and buildings of the Bible. And then this would be the, the Temple of Solomon. The Temple of Solomon um, clearly would have qualified for one of the wonders of the world if, if it had stayed in existence. But unfortunately, it gets destroyed by, by the Babylonians. But it was an amazing structure. And then I thought it would be appropriate also, if we're going to mention the Temple of Solomon, the temple that stood in Jesus' day was not the Temple of Solomon. It's, it was called Herod's Temple, or the Second Temple, it's sometimes called. This is an actual miniature of the temple. If you go to Jerusalem, they have a miniature of the city. I think it's like a 127th scale or something like that, or 116th scale. But they have the ancient city uh, you know, modeled, and this is from that model of what they think Herod's temple would have looked at. And I think it probably was an amazing structure, but it was nothing like what Solomon's temple was. The Bible says, I think it's in the book of Habakkuk, that when those who saw Solomon's temple, who were old, who also saw the new temple, they wept. So the elderly people who had seen Solomon's temple, you know, they were in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. Some of them saw Solomon's temple, and then they saw the new temple. And while the young people celebrated, we finished the new temple, it's wonderful. It says that the old people who saw Solomon said, what have we done? This is nothing compared to what Solomon's was like. But still um, worthy, of, uh, worthy of mention as far as uh, creations of, uh, uh, in the Bible days. This is the Ark of the Covenant. And not just the Ark of the Covenant, but really the entire sanctuary furniture system, I think, is worthy of mention. But the Ark itself was a, a very symbolic and powerful piece of the construction and the illustration of, of righteousness by faith that God introduced to his people. So I thought it would be worthy to mention the sanctuary uh, uh, furnishings in, in themselves. I know they're part of the, uh, uh, the temple, of course, but uh, I thought they uh, warranted separate mention. And then, um, is that the last one? All right, the last thing that I think is of the greatest that, that, that God's people have ever created, I chose this picture to illustrate it. Can you guess what I'm trying to illustrate? Wow, that was fast. Derek, I, I, I should think higher of you. I don't, that's just amazing talent that you have. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm trying to illustrate here. So all these other things are physical structures, right? They're statues and they're buildings and they're boats and there's furnishings. But the greatest thing that God has ever built and God's people have ever been involved in constructing and putting together is really a spiritual thing. And that is his church. That is us. That is his people in fellowship, in communion, in unity, despite our fallenness, despite our uniqueness, despite our differences from culture and language and background and worldview and everything else. The idea that God could pull together people of all these uh, 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 backgrounds and have us come together in one united thing, I think that outshines any building that's ever been built. I think that outshines any boat that's ever been built. Um, but in a way, there is a similarity and a... Uh, 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 an analogy between them. You see, it seems like it's been part of God's plan from the beginning to deal with the issue of sin. God puts his people to work. Okay? Whenever God wants to deal with sin, he puts his people to work. And he gives them an opportunity to build the very vehicle of salvation that is necessary 
for people to participate in if they want to have uh, uh, freedom from, from, from wrath and judgment and salvation from sin. Think about the ark itself. The ark is a symbol of the church. The ark is a symbol of, of Christ. It was the vehicle of salvation to escape judgment. And those who participated and, and got into that vehicle were saved while those who are on the outside perished, right? Okay, the temple, the temple, and, and the temple has an ark in it, right? And that's not just a, a verbal reference. That ark was also a vehicle of salvation. It was where the mercy seat sat. It's where the presence of God was. It was that structure that represented where God and man could come together in harmony and find freedom and find uh, 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 salvation and forgiveness of sins. It was the vehicle of salvation, was his temple, his sanctuary. And then in the New Testament, these things have continued. It has not stopped. God gives his people the opportunity to work, not to work our, out our own salvation. Not, this is not salvation by works. Okay, Salvation comes first, and out of appreciation for that salvation, he puts us to work. Is that okay? Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, for by the, uh, it's by grace through faith that we are saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are created for good works. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. So out of thankfulness for the salvation that he freely gives us, he puts us to work. He puts us to work. We're building a ship. We're building a temple. We're building a sanctuary. We're building a church. Because that church, that community, is now the vehicle through which salvation is merited to anyone in the world who will make that choice to join and be part of it. His pattern has not changed. It did not change from Old Testament to New Testament. The the personality and the reality and the anti-type, it meets type in the New Testament. But the pattern of God remains. He calls upon his people to work. Not to earn their salvation. Not to earn the, 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 uh, uh, to appease a wrathful God. That's not why we do it. But he puts us to work because we are saved by grace and he invites us to be the vehicle of grace to the world. Are you with me? Is that okay? So of all the illustrations of this in the Bible that we could go to, I want to take you to Exodus 35 for just a second. A few minutes, more than a second. Exodus 35, because... Uh, uh, you know, we can read about how Noah built the ark and we can go into spirit of prophecy and get some of the perspective there. And we can read about how Solomon built the temple. Of course, we read about how Jesus and the apostles founded the church and all these are relevant and wonderful. But I want to go back to kind of that first uh, 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 structure that comes into development with the sanctuary in the wilderness and read about how this uh, opportunity came to God's people and how they responded and what we can learn from that today. So Exodus 35, I'm going to jump around. I'm not going to just read the whole chapter verse by verse, but Exodus 35 is where I'm going to be focused. And I want you to notice that it begins, Exodus 35 begins with the Sabbath commandment being emphasized and further defined and explained. So it's very interesting. Just before Moses goes into a description of what is needed and how the people, the children of Israel, needed to to rally together, to pull together the resources, to pull together the workers for the development of the sanctuary and the building of the articles and the tent of meeting and all that. Just before that, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Sabbath is emphasized. And we could, I could spend all day on this, but what I want to point out to you is that God wants us to be present with Him in time as well as in space. He wants us to be present with him in the time of the Sabbath, but he also wants to give us a space to gather in order for us to meet with God. And that's why I think these two things go together. And we can talk more about that. But So the Sabbath is emphasized in the first eight or nine verses there. Uh, first four verses, I guess. But I want to come now to verse 5 of Exodus 35. So right after emphasizing the Sabbath, Moses says, "...take from among you a contribution to the Lord." Whoever is of a willing heart. Now, I want you to notice that little phrase. Okay? God had just saved them by miraculous power, brought them, uh, you know, for all of the, of the plagues on Egypt and, and coming through the Red Sea, and, and they've already been to Sinai, and they've already got the, 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 the covenant and the tablets. God, had, He was present through the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. He is doing mighty things in their presence. All right? Keep that in mind. And yet, even despite all that, God says, whatever you do, I want it to be of a willing heart. Now, I think that's pretty nice of God. 
By this time, I think God could very well have said, you know, I've done for you, you better do for me. I, I don't think that would have been out of the realm of possibility at this point. God had every authority. He had every way of saying, look, I want you just to go to every house and say 50% of what you've got, I need. Give it to me. And he probably would have been quite justified. But at this point, he says, no, this is still about the heart. I want people of a willing heart to participate. As a matter of fact, this is so sacred to me that in the building of this structure, in the development of this vehicle of salvation, it is essential that those who are part of it are there because they want to be there. I don't want anyone to be part of this if they feel coerced, if they feel that it's demanded of them. The whole idea of righteousness by faith and the salvation that is found in Jesus Christ must even symbolically come from people uniting because of a willing heart. Do you see what, I, see what I'm going with that? Okay, let me start over then. Okay. <laughs> we're we're going to keep, uh, keep, uh, keep on this because Moses repeats this so often. He says, take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever's of a willing heart, let him bring of the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, bronze, the, the linens, the scarlet, the, the skins, the oil for lighting. He mentions all these things that are necessary. Then when you come down to, um, I have these underlined. Come down to verse 21. Okay, I said I'm going to skip around. I'll go back to 20. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel departed from Moses' presence. Everyone whose heart stirred him, everyone whose spirit moved him, came and brought the Lord's contribution for the work of the tent of meeting, all its services and the holy garment. Now this goes to the, um, to the materials that they were gathering and bringing together to build this amazing structure in the wilderness. Okay? Now, they come out of Egypt as slaves, but when they came out of Egypt, remember the Egyptians were uh, compelled to give them all these gold, and, and, and they plundered Egypt as they got out. So you think, where do these slaves get all this? They got it because the Egyptians, in their rush to say, get out of here, we're tired of these plagues, they poured upon them um, these, these, ar these articles that they now have in their possession, and now they're donating them uh, because of the Spirit of the Lord. Again, Exodus 35, 21. Everyone whose heart stirred him, and whose spirit moved him came. It's a beautiful thought, isn't it? Verse 22, Then all whose hearts moved them, both men and women, came and they brought brooches, earrings, signet rings, bracelets, articles of gold. They did everything, who, and so did every man who presented an offering to the Lord. Verse 26, And all the women whose heart stirred, skilled, uh, stirred with a skill, spun the goat's hair. So they're not just donating, they're working. And that's going to be emphasized here in just a second. Verse 29, the Israelites, all the men and women whose hearts moved them to bring the material for all the work which the Lord had commanded through Moses brought a free will offering to the Lord. Over and over and over again, Moses and the Holy Spirit through Moses want to emphasize in the development of this plan, in the, in the, in the putting together of this vehicle and this vision, it's essential that the Spirit moves upon the hearts of the people. And they do it out of a deep, heart conviction verse 30 so moses said to all the sons of israel see the lord is called by name bezael the son of uri the son of her of the tribe of judah he has filled him with the spirit of god and wisdom and understanding and knowledge of all craftsmanship verse 34 he has also put in his heart to teach both he and aholiab the son of Asimelech of the tribe of dan so now god says uh, part of the contribution it's not just bringing the articles, but using your talents. And I have given the talents necessary for the success of the development of this tabernacle. A couple more verses. Chapter 36, it continues in verse 2. Then Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab, and every skillful, per skillful person in whom the Lord had put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him to come to the work to perform it. And you remember the result. It's mentioned down there in verse 5 of Exodus 36. They were so active in bringing their contribution that Moses and the, and the workers finally had to tell them, stop. We have so much. We have more than is needed. Sounds almost like a fairy tale. The church had so much resources and so many workers and so much opportunity that they had to actually restrain the people from continuing to give. 
Now, the simple question I have, oh, and I just wanted to illustrate. So you have this tabernacle in the wilderness. You have the children of Israel camped around it. And you think about what they were needing for all this. There was all the articles and the the interior. Remember, this was a a structure meant to be uh, disassembled and carried. And so there were all these uh, poles and loops and hooks. And and everything had to be beautifully woven with the finest materials and, and craftsmen. So this is what they were donating to. Not only that, but the the very garments that the priests wore had to be sacred and special. The high priest had this special apron that he wore called an ephod, and then he had the breastplate on it that had the urim and the thumb and beautiful term. And that, that, those things he wore 359 days a year. But on the Day of Atonement, they only had a 360-day year, not 365 like we do. On the 360th day, he wore nothing but plain white like the rest of the priests. Okay? But yet the other days he needed this beautiful vestment that signified uh, you know, his position and his role as the intercessor and as the antitype for Christ as well, the high priest with all of these articles. So this is what they were building. But the question came to me as I was contemplating this, what motivated the people? What was it in their hearts that stirred them to contribute so mightily to this cause? What is it that motivates individuals to rally with such power, with such, uh, uh, the word escapes me, a fusion of just giving and contributing? I mean, I want to know what it is. Don't you? I want to know what is it that motivates people to be so desirous to give to the work and the ministry of God's plan. Now, so part of this is just purely subjective and, and you know we could say well they were thankful for God saving them uh, you know they had a they had a sense of duty because of their culture they had a sense of identity with with Abraham and wanting to do it and, and all those are probably true I, I think you know their culture and their gratitude and their realization that they had been slaves and they'd seen God's power and they were they had this very real uh, physical embodiment of the presence of God with them and that was very motivational but I think it's simpler than that. I think it's simpler than that. First of all, though, I think God gave them a vision for what he wanted them to do. And in the midst of that vision, they were inspired to participate. But it wasn't just that. I think it comes down to this. Exodus 25, verse 8. God said, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. Why were they so anxious to build this sanctuary? Because they were anxious for the presence of God. Because they loved God. Because they wanted to be with God. They wanted to see Him. They wanted His presence. They coveted a a personal relationship with their Creator. So while the the, the duty is is a, a, a part of our nature and thankfulness and gratitude and history and culture, I think it's much simpler than that. I think they loved the Lord. I think they loved God. And when he said, I want to come and be in your midst, and the place and the way in which we can do that together is for us to combine our efforts and to make this beautiful sanctuary out of love for God's presence, they were willing to, to give cheerfully. You know the song we sing for our prayer song, Oh Lord, You're Beautiful. Oh Lord, You're Beautiful. Your face is all I see. For when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds. It doesn't come in drips. It's not just a little When your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. The Bible says that, or actually I wanted to reference this from Patriarchs and Prophets. It says their devotion, their zeal, their liberality are an example worthy of imitation. All who love the worship of God and prize the blessings of his sacred presence. You see that there? This is this is Mrs. White. And by the way, I I thought of the, the Exodus 25:8 before I read this. 
This was confirmation to me. All who love and worship the worship of God and prize the blessing of his sacred presence will manifest the same spirit of sacrifice in preparing a house where he may meet with them. We may not have an Ark of the Covenant on our stage right now. We may not have pillars and, and veils. We may not have vestments and, and candelabras. But this is still the house where God desires to meet with us. And he meets with us in our private Bible studies. He meets with us in our prayer closets. He meets with us in nature. I'm not trying to say you can't be with God elsewhere. But this is still the house where God desires to be with his people. And it's through the ministries of this congregation and this house that he desires that that message of salvation will become available to our community, to everyone in this world to our city, to our campus, and our kids. All who love the worship of God and prize the blessing of His sacred presence. You know, I've said this before, and I mentioned it in a meeting I was uh, in earlier. And I, I, for, Forgive me for getting a little too Pentecostal and spiritual here on you today. I tingle when I walk through the doors of the church. I do. Even when I'm here in the office during the week. Vince, on a Monday when I come in here, it's not that this place is only sacred on Sabbath. I know that God is here. That this is a, a special place set aside and established for His worship and for His people to build that community that is so desperately needed in these last days. In the days in which we live. People need a sanctuary. A place where God's presence is worshipped and His presence is desired. And out of a heart that is moved by the Holy Spirit to participate in the establishment of this congregation and this ministry is a privilege to be a part of. They will desire to bring to the Lord an offering of the very best. I don't always succeed in that. I do not always succeed in giving God my best. I struggle. I'm human. But it is my desire that when I come into God's presence, that my heart is right, that my mind is open that I'm ready to act on whatever the Spirit stirs in my soul. And we know the result. Thus Moses finished the work. Okay? Notice this, the end of the book of Exodus. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When God's people responded to the Holy Spirit, when they caught the vision of what God was trying to accomplish, and they successfully moved. God did something powerful in their presence. His very physical presence in the cloud, in the Spirit, came and rested on that sanctuary. Moses was not able to enter the tent because the cloud had settled, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God responded in power and in glory and in real time to the response of His people uniting in their efforts. I desire an opportunity with this congregation to craft a vision that pulls us all together where our hearts are stirred, not by my cajoling Mitch, not because I'm twisting arms, but because you know that the Holy Spirit has given you talent and given you knowledge, and given you inspiration to be part of a development of a vehicle of salvation. And when we do work together, the glory of the Lord will fill this temple. Not for our own sake and vanity and pride, but because in the last days, 
This should be a place where God's presence dwells. Notice this from the book of Revelation. After these things I looked. This is Revelation 15, by the way. This is kind of the the end of that middle section of chapters 12, 13, and 14. This is kind of the summation of that, that, that pericope of information. After these things I looked, and the temple of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. Notice that he emphasizes the tabernacle. I'm not saying that the temple wasn't a powerful, wonderful place. The temple is very important. But he points back to the very tabernacle that we read about in Exodus 35. John says, I saw that structure. The tabernacle, it was open. The seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple, clothed in linen, clean and, clean and bright. They looked like the very priests that ministered in the temple. Clothed in glory, clothed in light, clothed in clean, white, bright, girded around with their chest and golden sashes. And notice what happens. Then one of the four living creatures, which by the way, fascinating study on who the four living creatures are. I don't have time to give you my theories on that. There's no general consensus even among the Jews, on who the four living creatures were. He gave to the seven angels seven bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Notice, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. Have you heard that before? Didn't we just read that from Exodus? And from his power, no one was able to enter the temple, just like Moses wasn't able to enter the temple when it was first set up there in Exodus chapter 40, until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Notice this. Revelation itself says, in the last days, I need to have an established temple where people are worshiping and working together that my glory can fill, and that will be the place that people will be safe during the last plagues. That is the vehicle of salvation. That is what will preserve us and save us because of our faithfulness to God and our appreciation for what He's done for us. You know, we were slaves in Egypt too. We were slaves to our own sin. And when the God came into your heart and invited you into a relationship with Him, you went through the waters of the Red Sea in baptism as well. This is not just a story from the dusty pages of an old book. This is our story as well. I don't know where else we should be these last days. I don't know what else should take priority in our lives than the work of the church. I'm not, hey, I love sports, Dean Mark. I do. I, you know, I'm looking forward to the Seahawks season. I know they're going to do great things. Okay, I have my distractions and my hobbies. I'm not trying to say there's not life that's lived. But I think God will bless those who make the work of His church the highest priority in the last days. And I invite you to pray. I invite you to counsel with the Holy Spirit. I invite you in your own devotional prayer time. Before we get, you know, I'm going to continue on on this journey with you through the month of September as we build towards crafting our vision at the end of the month. But before we get there, I invite you to go to your knees in your own prayer closet, in your own devotional times, whether you pray at night before bed or maybe in the morning or wherever you do it, that you would continue to seek the Lord and ask Him, Lord, stir my heart. Stir my heart. If I'm complacent, Lord, remove that from me. If I lack vision, Lord, give me vision. If I have guilt that's keeping me, Lord, remove that. But give me a heart. Give me a heart for your ministry. Give me a heart for your temple. Stir my heart that I could join and be part of what you're doing in this church in the last days. Let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. Do you really covet the presence of God? Do you really desire to be with Him? I pray that the love of the Father, that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the grace of Jesus Christ would reign supreme in everyone's heart who's part of the church and that we would find His plan for making a difference, for not just being a church that bobs along, but for being an actual center of power and influence before Jesus Christ returns to this earth. Father, 
as we close here, I know that these are just words. These are just analogies. These are our stories, very important stories. And Father, I know I cannot be a substitute for your sweet spirit. I cannot replace the gentle whisper. I cannot replace the lightning that struck Paul. I cannot be the one who motivates hearts. Lord, it has to come from you. And Lord, it's not my my plan to put anybody in an uncomfortable position or to force anyone to make a decision they're not ready to make. Father, I'm just excited to be part of your church in these days. I get discouraged. I get depressed by everything happening in the world and in the news. But Lord, when I return to your plan, when I return to your scriptures and your promises, Lord, it inspires me. And I pray that we would all be equally inspired to covet your presence. For when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. Bless us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. I love you all. I pray that you have a wonderful Labor Day weekend. We'll see you next week. God bless.